Welcome to HealthCast, the heartbeat of health IT. I'm your host, Melissa Harris. We are here today for our second episode of our six-part National Cancer Act 50th Anniversary Commemoration mini-series, where we'll be examining the Act's various impacts on cancer research and development, treatment, screening, and more over the last half century. Although we'll be talking about cancer diagnostics and treatment innovation over the past 50 years in this episode, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to our first episode with Dr. Ned Sharpless, Director of the National Cancer Institute, where we learned more about the history of the NCA and cancer as a whole. Without further ado, let's go into episode two, a deep dive into innovation and progress in cancer diagnostics, therapies, and treatment with two NCI experts in the field. Dr. James Dorishow, and Dr. Meg Mooney. Let's start with where the fields of treatment and diagnostics were upon the passage of the National Cancer Act in 1971. Dr. Dorishow is the perfect person to start us off. He first joined NCI in 1975, just four years after the NCA was signed into law. In 1971, there really were only a very limited number of FDA-approved anti-cancer systemic therapeutic agents to use. It was really only about five or six years after the initial demonstration that combining some of those agents, uh, even though there were few, combining them led to long-term remissions in pediatric uh, leukemia uh, patients. And for the first time in the late 1960s, just before the National Cancer Act was assigned, evidence that combining some of these Uh, systemic anti-cancer agents led to prolonged remissions in adults with uh, various kinds of lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so when I arrived uh, at the NCI at that time, it really, uh, we were just trying to explore how to make those initial treatments more tolerable and how to improve on the various diagnostic approaches to those diseases. And from a diagnostic perspective, uh, really, the technologies, the radiologic technologies, were really rather limited. Uh, CT scanning had just been discovered in the United Kingdom and was not at all routinely available in the United States. And so various kinds of the x-rays that were used were imprecise. It was difficult to measure the size of a patient's tumors. It was um, some technologies that have been long since discarded were utilized to try to assess the size of lymph nodes so as to measure the effectiveness of drugs. All in all, there were essentially no blood tests other than blood counts to measure after one gave uh, treatments. So things were really relatively crude. Fortunately, the NCA enabled better basic science and cancer research, which unveiled discoveries and brought better technologies and options for cancer diagnostics and treatment, as Dr. Mooney will tell us about. There have been really so many key interventions that have been based on what we've learned from the investment that's been made by the American public in NCI-funded basic science research, epidemiologic investigations, and as well as cancer research, as well as with the dedication of so many investigators, patients, and their families, as well as their communities who've really been partners in this research over the past 50 years. And one of the most seminal improvements was made very early in probably our most basic tool of treating cancer, which is surgical resection, particularly, obviously, for early uh, stage types of cancer. And so a real seminal improvement in surgical therapy came from the results of an NCI-funded cancer clinical trial in the 1980s. And that was a trial which showed that with for women with early stage breast cancer, they could be treated with breast-conserving surgery or what we call lumpectomy today, followed by whole breast radiation therapy. And that had similar survival uh, rates and disease-free survival rates for women who had previously been treated with uh, mastectomies and sometimes with radical mastectomy. And I think that's a really basic historic achievement that really points to the value of the public investment because it radically changed the way women were treated who had early uh, stage breast cancer And it also reflected what we were beginning to understand about the later stages of cancer and of breast cancer in particular, that it wasn't just a local disease. And so if you could take more tissue from around where the tumor was, that would help in terms of survival. Um, And it really reflected our beginning to really understand the underlying biology 
which meant that breast cancer, once it became more invasive, was a systemic disease and really had to be treated with other modalities. And that kind of highlights what I also wanted to emphasize of what's happened over the past 50 years. And sometimes it's hard to remember we didn't have many basic therapies back in the 1950s because things have changed so dramatically. But NCI really played a pivotal role through the researchers and, and all the patients who participated in our clinical trials in really developing combination chemotherapy. Um, And then later, bone and marrow transplants and further advancements in radiation therapy that really led to quite dramatic reductions in mortalities in certain cancers. And just to point to one of the most striking improvements, that's been the use of these various therapies, both combination therapy alone, as well as in combination with transplant and or radiation therapy, so that there's been a striking improvement in childhood cancers over the past 50 years. And if you were to look between 1955 and the mid-2000s over that 50-year period, it's really remarkable that the survival rates for childhood cancer have gone from a very low rate of 10% to almost 80% and even farther now in some types of childhood cancer because of the improvements in cancer therapy that were borne out by clinical trials done over that 50-year period. Although that's just one example that Dr. Mooney provided, there's a lot more that the NCA enabled in the diagnostics and treatment space as it brought about better understanding of basic science of cancer cells. The investment in cancer biology that was fostered by the National Cancer Act has led decade by decade to improvements in both diagnosis and treatment. And so let me give some examples of what I'm talking about. It was really only at the time that the NCA was uh, approved was there beginnings of information about how some tumor cells had specific kinds of proteins on their surface that controlled their growth. And the discovery of the estrogen receptor allowed us for the first time to try to pick out which patients with breast cancer might be better treated with hormonal therapy than with chemotherapy. That was something that was relatively new in the early 1970s. As the biology improved, and it became clear that there were many different types of proteins at the cell surface of many tumor cells, approaches, chemical approaches to developing agents that could target those proteins started to become more prevalent. And so uh, really it took somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 years before the thought that there could be targeted therapies, in particular antibodies uh, that uh, could control the effectiveness of these growth factors and or hormones. And those antibodies were developed in the late 1980s. And so that really was the growth of the anti-HER2 therapies, Herceptin and the like, and it's made such an enormous difference in the treatment of breast cancer. From there, the notion that one could use some of these receptors and other signaling pathways to define further how the biology of the cancers could be interfered with led to really what is now a 20 plus year revolution in the development of targeted therapeutics that have, while they're not without side effects, they have fewer side effects and different kinds of side effects than the systemic cytotoxic agents that were the primary focus of therapeutic development in the 70s and 80s and into the early 90s. And then we're now, of course, in the age of immunotherapy, all made possible by a much greater understanding of how various parts of the human immune system can be manipulated to favor the eradication of tumors rather than, and to interfere with the proteins that tumors make that to decrease the effectiveness of the human Im- immune system. Basic science of cancer and biomedicine has certainly led to overall progress in the cancer field. Even though doctors Dorishow and Mooney described some of the progress over time, all of these strides have led to progress in making early screening and treatment of certain cancers a lot better. Breast, colon, and lung cancers, for instance, have become a lot more easy to detect because of certain tests developed over the decades. These include mammograms, pap smears, colonoscopies, the National Lung Screening Test, fecal occult blood tests, and other blood tests. 
The 1980s brought a lot of these screenings to common clinical practice too. Mammography became common in the clinical space in the 80s for detection of breast cancer, for instance, and the introduction of CT scans have enabled low-dose CT scans to vastly improve lung cancer screening. Not only have technologies and screening improved, but treatment and therapies for certain cancers have also seen strides. Doctors Mooney and Dorschau went into this a little, but emerging surgeries, combinational chemotherapy, radiology, hormone and targeted therapies, and more recently, cellular immunotherapy have emerged as some of the leading ways to effectively treat various types of cancer. Immunotherapy in particular has been thought of as relatively nascent in clinical practice, but it really started to emerge in trials and research as early as the 1970s. I'm very fortunate in that regard to have had the experience uh, early in my career to uh, study the technology that was invented at the NCI in uh, the mid to late 70s by Steve Rosenberg and his colleagues. And so the story basically goes around the time that the National Cancer Act was passed, there were investigators at the NCI on the Bethesda campus that were deeply involved in trying to understand how viruses cause cancer. And in that context, they were very interested in how viruses change the growth characteristics of tumor cells and whether there were proteins that could be involved in the transformation of the normal cells to leukemic cells. And in the context of those investigations, in the early, mid-70s, uh, investigators discovered a protein called interleukin-2, which is produced by immune cells, that was really critical for the growth of, at that time, newly discovered subclasses of lymphocytes immune cells. And that particular protein was, once it was discovered and it was studied, turned out to be a critical regulator of the growth of um, T lymphocytes, which are essential for the immune response against many different things, but certainly for cancer. And with the development, purification, and um, actually the production of large amounts of interleukin-2, it was discovered by Dr. Rosenberg that taking large numbers of lymphocytes that could be separated from a patient's blood, incubating those cells with interleukin-2, led to the development of what he initially called lymphokine-activated killer cells, and thus began really the first systematic cellular immunotherapy trials at the NCI, beginning in the late 1970s or thereabouts, in which patients were, their lymphocytes were harvested on special leukophoresis machines. They were incubated almost on an industrial scale and then reinfused into the patient in combination with this protein stimulant, IL-2. And so um, the reason I, I know something about this is that I was very fortunate early on in the early 1980s to be at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. It wasn't a comprehensive cancer center at that time. And we were selected as one of six institutions, two in the West Coast, two in the Heartland, and two on the East Coast, to try to duplicate the studies that Dr. Rosenberg had conducted in the clinical center, where he showed that patients, specifically patients with renal cancer and uh, melanoma with advanced disease, refractory to cytotoxic chemotherapy, that a percentage of those patients, somewhere in the range of 10%, between 10 to 15% of those patients developed durable, long-lasting, complete remissions. And there had never been any patients with those two diseases that had ever been treated with any systemic therapy that led to long-term relapse-free survival. And so we were very lucky to be able to participate in confirmatory studies of that approach. And really, the growth of the field has been led in large part by studies done at the clinical center by Dr. Rosenberg and his group, as well as many other investigators, to develop a greater and greater understanding of the molecular mechanisms by which immune cells kill tumor cells, to develop more sophisticated methodologies 
to hone in on the particular kinds of cells that invade tumors and to purify them and to be able to, to stimulate them and give them back to patients and produce remissions. And so TIL cell therapy, which Dr. Rosenberg also developed, is now an FDA-approved process. There are commercial companies that will take tumors that are removed surgically, grow these immune cells, and uh, send them back to institutions for reinfusion. And the entire process over the last nearly 15 years of understanding how to manipulate T-cell biology by uh, Dr. Rosenberg, by investigators at the University of Pennsylvania and, and at Harvard, et cetera, in combination with our understanding how, how the function of the T-cell actually can be manipulated has led to this enormous breakthroughs of, for the treatment of childhood acute leukemia, for advanced adult leukemias and lymphomas, and now just to last week, approval by the FDA for so-called uh, chimeric antigen modified uh, T cells for the treatment of um, myeloma. And so this has just been a remarkable, again, adventure in which the understanding of the immune system has led, uh, you know, year by year and really decade by decade to more and more refined approaches to actually harnessing one's own cellular immune system to tackle not only hematopoietic system tumors, but also more recently to uh, treat patients with um, cervical cancer and other diseases uh, that are associated with infections by, uh, by viral infections. So this has just been a remarkable process that, again, is underlain by the uh, advanced understanding of uh, tumor cell biology and tumor cell immunology. Even with advances like immunotherapy and other treatments, as well as those in screening and diagnostics, there are certain cancers that remain as challenge areas in both treatment and diagnostics. Some of the cancers that are very hard to detect at an early stage include pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, rare cancers of what we call the hepatobiliary tract, which includes liver cancer. So those are just a few that are very difficult to pick up at an early stage. And a lot of that is because there really isn't, isn't no specific early symptoms associated with those cancers. So often patients don't become aware of any symptoms until the tumor is very advanced. We also don't have any blood biomarkers that have what we call the appropriate sensitivity and specificity to pick up an early stage cancer of those types. And then we really don't have a very clinically practical physical examination that we can make of those solid tumors that really would help in picking up early stage disease. A lot of that is, of course, because of where those particular organs are located within the, the human body. There just is no way to examine them. And we don't really have a, a very, very sensitive, in some cases, imaging technologies for those types of cancers as well. So in order to attack that problem, there probably are several different ways people are looking at it. But one area that I wanted to highlight was in pancreatic cancer, where it's been very difficult to pick up early stage pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And so uh, several studies have been put in place to identify individuals who are at high risk, either because they have family history of the disease, which is rare, but does exist in pancreatic adenocarcinoma, or because they have features that we think lead to being at high risk, such as diabetes, for example. And we're trying to follow longitudinally cohorts of patients who are at high risk, at the same time trying to improve imaging modalities of the pancreas as we follow those patients and also looking for potential biomarkers, so blood biomarkers that might help us detect something. Or if there's an early lesion that's picked up in the pancreas and then it can be resected and it hasn't yet advanced to invasive adenocarcinoma, trying to understand sort of the carcinogenesis, the early carcinogenesis of that disease that might help us identify targets that we could use in the screening process. There are also other efforts to maybe just look at a general blood test that might help in identifying different types of cancer just through a blood test. Now that's very early in development, 
but we're hopeful that as time goes on, we'll maybe be able to perfect that. So there might be a way someday in the future to detect early on these very hard to diagnose cancers. Unfortunately, cancers that are difficult to detect are also difficult to treat. Again, pancreatic, ovarian, and liver cancers are some of NCI's biggest challenge areas. Well, one of the hardest problems is even if we have therapy for which patients initially respond to treatment, it often recurs and metastasizes, which means it spreads to other organs of the body. And so there's quite a bit of research and clinical trials evaluating what we call sensitivity to particular drug therapies, as well as the underlying causes of resistance that develops to those therapies. And that can be for chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy. And so that is certainly one of the largest areas, in addition to trying to target very difficult to treat cancer, such as pancreatic cancer, brain cancer. So those two dilemmas, trying to treat cancers that have remained very resistant to all kinds of therapies like brain cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer and other cancers, as well as when we do have effective therapies, whether in early stage disease that occurs at a a later phase or when patients have more advanced disease that seems to, their, their cancer seems to respond initially, but then acquires what we call resistance to that therapy and new and other therapies have to be identified. And so those are two major areas that we're trying to figure out what really happens in those circumstances. What causes that resistance? How do we treat that resistance? Fortunately, New and ongoing clinical trials are leading the way in which NCI and other researchers are looking forward in cancer treatment and therapy options. Some of these advancements have come through immunotherapy, which we just touched upon, and the emergence of individualized treatment, also known as precision medicine. Plays a very big role, I think, um, because that's really where we're going in terms of treatment, is really trying to identify, as I said, the particular Sometimes they're genetic mutations, sometimes there are other types of molecular characteristics associated with a particular type of cancer that allows us to individualize treatment. Now, usually within a certain type of molecular characterization, a particular subgroup of patients within a general cancer type may all have the same or very similar types of molecular characterizations in their tumor. And being able to fashion a treatment for that subset of patients has really helped in terms of us being much more specific in our individual therapy for those patients and more beneficial when the particular therapy has been so targeted. In addition, there is new evidence with cellular therapies that we may be able, for example, with CAR T cell therapy to develop very patient-specific, very individualized therapies that could hopefully someday dramatically reduce cancer mortality, not just in hematologic malignancies, but also in solid tumors. Not only are researchers building off emerging scientific discoveries to find new solutions to cancer treatment, but the clinical trials themselves have evolved drastically over the past 50 to 60 years from being siloed to connected through networks of institutions that work together in clinical study protocol. This lets researchers better understand whether particular approaches are more effective or not. Systemic changes like this have helped advance childhood cancer treatment discoveries, for instance. There were early what we call pediatric cooperative group networks that were studying together in a network different therapies for childhood cancer. And one of the first ones was formed in 1955, so not long after the National Cancer Act. And through that network, which now today has coalesced into one large national network called the Children's Oncology Group, is what was really doing that collaborative research together that really led to incremental and then significant improvements in reducing child mortality from cancer. The other thing that's happened is our ability with new technology tools, advances in statistical science, and just technology in general to begin to be able to make more what we call biomarker-driven therapies. So with our ability now to really understand more the underlying biology and molecular characteristics 
of a particular type of cancer that a patient may have, we've been able to develop biomarkers and what we call targeted therapies that really address the specific molecular characterizations or genetic mutations of a particular cancer that an individual has. And so being able to do those types of trials in a network that's national and sometimes even international collaborations as well has really dramatically changed not only the way we conduct clinical trials, but also the advances we've been able to make. Advancements in clinical trials, as well as recent moves to expand them by loosening regulation requirements and enabling remote access with digital technologies and telehealth, has led NCI to develop better treatment and screening options for people. This is especially the case for those who are underrepresented in traditional clinical trials in cancer studies, such as people of color and minority populations. So this is a major concern that um, the NCI has taken on. And what we are trying to do is to learn as much as we can from the changes in our whole clinical trials procedures that uh, were required because and, and are required based on the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So we very quickly, actually a year ago, within about a month of the time that the, so many of our institutions were shut down, we made enormous changes to the way we conduct our clinical trials. We made it easier to get patient consent. Primarily, in response to your question, we in, invoked the um, new guidance from the FDA that allowed telehealth visits to substitute for in-person visits. Uh, for patients enrolled on our clinical trials. We decreased some of the requirements for adverse event reporting that uh, were really unnecessary. And what all of this has done, and, and many others, and we basically learned how to, that it was possible to ship oral uh, investigational agents to the site of where the patients are getting care, rather than to make patients drive, in some cases, hundreds of miles to academic medical centers to receive their treatment because that's where the drugs were sent. And what we are in the process of doing now is trying to investigate how we can actually go further in uh, institutionalizing those changes and others that we're considering, particularly the use of telehealth to uh, make it much easier for individuals who, especially individuals who live in underserved communities or at to long distances from major academic medical centers for individuals who live in rural communities to get access to some of the -the state-of-the-art therapeutic agents that are available in our clinical trials. This was actually the subject of a year-long strategic planning process that concluded last November that was conducted by our clinical trials advisory committee, and we're just beginning the implementation process to make some of these major changes to enhance our ability to not just inform the studies that we do, but to make them much more available to individuals who are underserved by the greater academic and greater medical community. As NCI continues to diversify and sharpen trials and processes to get to better diagnostics and treatment options, Dr. Dorishow continued by sharing the best ways physicians can stay up to date with emerging cancer treatment options for their patients. One of the most important ways that physicians actually understand new treatments that are in the process of development is to actually participate in that development process themselves. And so we have close to 2,000 sites, community sites as well as academic sites, but the majority of them in that large number are community sites that conduct clinical trials as part of one of NCI's clinical trials networks. And so physicians in practice in the community in essentially all 50 states have access to early, at the early application of therapies that are not yet FDA approved, but uh, where they can actually participate in studies that uh, compare those new treatments to standard of care treatments. And so when new therapies are actually then subsequently approved on the basis of those trials, they will be well equipped to initiate treatment with those new agents in their own practices. This is a, an enormous undertaking that is um, basically conducted under the auspices of our a national clinical, NCI National Clinical Trials Network, as well as the Division of Cancer Prevention's NCORE program. 
Continuing along the lines of getting best practices and treatment options out there through physician involvement in trials, Dr. Dorschau also shared some tips for you, our listeners, to keep in mind to prevent and catch cancer early. If you're a smoker, stop. There is nothing more important than stopping smoking to decrease your overall health risks as well as your risk of cancer. So that's number one. If you have been a smoker, it's quite clear that recent changes in screening guidelines strongly suggest that um, if you're over the age of 50 and have a significant smoking history, you ought to participate in a early lung cancer detection program with spiral CT scanning, which can make a significant difference to pick up our early stage lesions. Even if you're not a smoker, or whether you are or you aren't, and you're over 50, get your colonoscopy, get your mammogram. You know, these are really critically important things that uh, every individual should think about. And last but absolutely not least, because I have the pleasure and have for a decade and a half of working every day with Dr. Doug Lowy, who is the uh, basically the father of the um, HPV vaccine. You know, this is something that every child needs to get uh, early on because this is one of the most significant, if not the most significant advance over the last 20 years that has come from NCI-supported research. We have the ability to actually wipe out cervical cancer for the most part in the United States. And so this is something that uh, every man, and actually in my view, every woman, man, excuse me, every woman and, and in my view, every man ought to be vaccinated to prevent this uh, problem and to wipe out this disease in our lifetime. Thank you to Dr. Dorschau, Dr. Muni, NCI, and the whole cancer treatment and diagnostics community for your work and insight. Remember that getting ahead of cancer early with regular screenings is key. And clearly throughout this discussion, we've seen how fortunate we are to have the technology that's evolved over decades of work to make cancer survivability and prevention a reality. We still have a ways to go to beat cancer, but I'm so glad y'all joined me today to commemorate 50 plus years of dedication to progress. And before we go, remember that this is the second part of our six part mini series in honor of the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. We'll be releasing episodes every other month throughout the year. And our third episode on cancer disparities will release in June. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. HealthCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentciomedia.com slash podcasts. If you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. HealthCast is produced by Amy Kluber, hosted by Melissa Harris and Adam Patterson. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com.